Honorable Raksha Mantri Sheikh Antony, Dr. Saraswat, SA to RM, uh, Mr. Mathur, Secretary of Defense Production, uh, distinguished guests from the aerospace fraternity, our students, aerospace engineers, I noticed some of you are here in the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here in Bangalore uh, this morning. In fact, it's nice to be back uh, with a lot of sunshine here. When I left Delhi, it was raining and it was cold. And I hope it remains like this for the next couple of days that we're going to be here in Bangalore. Uh, actually, over the years, this biannual congregation of aerospace leaders uh, has evolved into a very good program. And as we start and kickstart the Air India 2013 tomorrow, uh, we truly really hope that all the deliberations that we discuss and debate uh, in the next two days here will stand us in long stead uh, during the course of this air show. I also compliment DRDO and the Aeronautical Society of India and CII for all the hard work they've done towards organizing the seminar and, of course, for choosing this very important theme, aerospace products, challenges in design and development. Of course, it's also heartening to note that there's growing national consensus in India towards recognizing the strategic importance of the aerospace industry. And I think it's long overdue. And I believe that in the next few years, we're already seeing the benefits of this understanding. And when I look at the who's who of the aerospace industry sitting here in front of me, it gives me a lot of confidence that uh, whatever we discuss now and what we're going to debate upon uh, will certainly offer many empowering options uh, to not only to the people in the Air Force, but also to the industry as well. As you perhaps are aware, uh, the IAF, and I speak on behalf of the Air Force, that uh, we are transforming into a multi-spectrum strategic force. And this process uh, was kick-started about five years ago uh, in the 11th plan itself. We just concluded uh, in 2011 and 2012 we started the, the 12th plan period. And uh, just to give you a scale of uh, the volume of work towards this endeavor, so that at least you'll understand uh, where exactly we're heading, that in the 11th plan itself, the IF signed something like 325 capital contracts. And the volume of these contracts were 1,52,000 crores which in dollar terms works out to $28.5 billion. Interestingly enough, about $15.5 billion of this amount, which is actually can translate that into terms of contracts, which are about 217 contracts, and about 84,000 crores, all of these went to the Indian defense companies, which, which somehow uh, many people find difficult to believe so 66% of this volume of the contracts with the IAF signed was with our indigenous industries as well. And in the 12th plan itself, we have the plans for going up to something like 350 to 400 aircraft itself to overhaul and reinvent new air force for the 21st and the 22nd century. So you can see the amount of scales that we're going into in the next few years itself. And like they say, you have to walk the talk, and therefore I must tell you that the results of this, uh, some of the results, of course, uh, of this uh, endeavor has been that uh, last month we had three Augusta 101 VIP helicopters which arrived in India. We've already started flying them. Three more will come in March, and the balance three will come in July. So by the middle of the year, we will have our VVIP fleets uh, fully ready we also have, in fact, by the time we finish the inaugural session, by about 11 o'clock or so this morning, our first Pilatus PC-7 uh, Mark II aircraft will be arriving at the Bangalore Air Show. Where he's flying. He's already taken off from Hyderabad, and he arrived day before yesterday from Switzerland. So that will start to fulfill the need of the training needs of the Indian Air Force for the next 30 to 40 years. You'll also see tomorrow the C-17 parked on the tarmac. Uh, of course, that's a U.S. aircraft. But the Indian aircraft strategic airlifter will arrive here in June this year, followed by one aircraft every month, so that by the middle of next year, our strategic airlift will be actually more or less complete in that category of aircraft. 
Also in this financial year, this forthcoming financial year, 2013 onwards and 2014, we're planning to finalize the contract for the MMRCA, the additional six C-130 special ops aircraft, the uh, Apache 22 attack helicopters, the heavy lift helicopters, and a host of other systems <coughs> that will actually see us through in terms of the strike capability, in terms of attack capability, as also in terms of the airlift capability. In addition to many other surface-to-air defense systems, communication, airfield modern infrastructure. But in our view, what actually is going to propel us forward in order to make the IF a recognable military power is that we have to stop importing and start doing things more and more indigenously. And for that, actually, we need your support, and that's why we're here to discuss some of these options. And when one looks at the defense production sector, it's true that in the following the independence, there was certainly a lot of emphasis to our DPSUs. In fact, they were the only ones uh, who actually were in this game. But in post-independence, and especially in the last few years, and if you see what's happening in the global changing economic world, the focus is now beginning to shift so that there's some amount of fair play and some amount of level playing field for all the players in this field. Because most of our firms today in the indigenous sector are actually in the tier two and the tier three level only. Even HL is somewhat limited in the tier one level, especially when it comes to just about license production and, and some integration work. So we actually have to have players who are moving into the tier one stage with enhanced capacities and far more production capability as well. The aerospace sector itself <coughs> has some very peculiar requirements. It's high technology. It's also highly capital intensive. And if you look at the entire life cycle chain, you're looking at uh, characteristics of uh, intense R&D, engineering design, manufacturing, assembly, maintenance, and followed, of course, by repair and overall. And due to the intense technology and the other requirements that I just mentioned, the two areas where we really have to focus on is on the R&D effort and, of course, in quality control. And in the processes which control these activities are the most important. Just two days ago, I was reading a paper on the F-35 and some of the problems that it had recently, and that actually related to not the production problems with any equipment, but also it involved some issues related to the processes in the quality control. And I think this also we need to take note of, especially when we talk of some of our indigenous projects like the LCA itself. When we look at the Indian aerospace ecosystem, then there are four factors which clearly stand out, uh, at least in our favor. First, of course, is the, what Dr. Saraswat mentioned about the regular and the supply chain of quality of engineers who need to be mentored and who need to be groomed in the sector. Then, of course, the supply of the blue-collar workforce. Uh, third, of course, is the supply chain, and then, of course, the potential uh, to reach critical mass. And with a clear cost advantage of around 15 to 25 percent in manufacturing, I feel the Indian industry today offers very attractive investment options uh, to large number of international players. And I'm very confident that in the coming decade or so, the Indian aerospace sector will truly come of age and become a significant player in the overall global aerospace supply chain. Quite often I'm asked that what is it that the IF seeks, at least in terms of technology options, and uh, what are the technology that we actually seek to have in the next 20 to 30 years. Up front, a few things that come to my mind, of course, is that we need to have the ISA radar technologies, and we must have that capability as soon as possible. Of course, with the Rafale that will be inducted as and when the contract gets signed, it will have the ISI itself, but we need to develop that into an indigenous option as well. We need to look at integrated EW suites for our combat fleets. We, look, we need to look at the, the network-centric operation, which also includes the software design radios, and the networks that support these kind of operations. And also at the same time, the cybersecurity issues that are enmeshed in these programs. We're also looking at the emerging drone technologies, 
and uh, if I may add, the UCAVs as well, and that's an area where we really need to focus upon and address the software support challenges which face us while integrating the high-technology aircraft and the weapon systems procured from abroad with the existing Indian environment. And if you were to ask me what does the IF seek from the aerospace industry itself, my answer would, would be that actually we're looking for long-term long -term partners. We don't want uh, fly-by-night operators. We want partners who, are, who have credibility and who are going to stay the long haul with the services. Specifically, actually, we would like the CIA. We would like the CIA to establish an aerospace group itself. And this group is the one that is going to support and guide all the activities of the industry while closely enmeshed with the three services, the Army, Air Force, and the Navy. And at the same time, they need to look, take into account the India's national policies, our strategic interests, so that these are not compromised while we go headlong into developing new projects. We also need to look at the operational availability because it is not just the production. The industry also will have to look at the maintainability and issues because these include the diagnosis on board aircraft. We need to require modern test rigs for easy recovery of LRUs. And most importantly, we need to have a logistics supply chain for the supply, repair, and overhaul of our systems in the long term. Uh, so far, our modernization plans have been somewhat restricted because of the timelines in which many of our projects have actually slipped. And therefore, it is important that when we set down our critical projections, these have to be made very realistic and that there's a detailed analysis of the scope of the design and development. And this requires the knowledge available and desired technical expertise to be all enmeshed together. And then the projections are forecast because these tend to spin off and result in catastrophic results at the end of any major program. The other issue peculiar to the aerospace sector is the need to have diverse work centers for handling complex aeronautical programs. Invariably, the program suffers due to non-ownership resulting from poor coordination amongst the diverse work centers. Therefore, first and foremost, there has to be greater accountability as also a need to modify our approach to designing for manufacturability and maintainability rather than keeping design and production at two opposite ends of the pole. The LCA Tejas program, which Dr. Sarath has also mentioned, is actually considered as the epitome of corporate collaboration. We have something like over 100 primary and about 300 uh, secondary work centers ranging from the R&D labs of DRDO, CSIR, Similite, DJ Equa, defense PSUs like HL and Bell, and a number of other private sector players, all being coordinated by one single agency, that's ADA. And the problem here is that the production and the design houses are two different issues, are two different agencies who report to different work centers. In addition, what we have to make sure that the production house will also require a production design to meet the stringent requirements of quality specs. And so the enormity of the coordination task and the resultant effect on the overall program is something that we all have to worry about. Therefore, we seriously need to consider for all future projects is first you have to have the management structure right before we embark on a very major program. And if necessary, it has to be tweaked along the line so that you get the end result as what we're looking at. We also have some suggestions for our Indian model. Because depending upon the work share, the project leaders should be the key appointment holders at the work centers. And a nodal center actually should be nominated for continuously monitoring the performance of the work output of these centers. In addition, there has to be a provision of dual assessment from program office as well as a nodal center, and the professional growth must be linked to the timely delivery of the work share. And I will even go on to the next stage that we need to institute financial penalties in case of poor performance of any work center, either by withholding certain payments and or recovery of the monies already spent. Therefore, there is a need to address the design to production disconnect. 
And I believe that a senior level officer from the production house at the executive director level will have to function full time on the program and co locate himself with the program office itself. I also believe that in all these program structures, there has to be a body of people who are actually involved with the project, who are the users, who have to be fully enmeshed in these programs. As Dr. Saraswat mentioned, that India is very fortunate to have a very positive demographic profile, which is ably supported by credible inf educational infrastructure. Today we have something like over 380 universities, about 11,200 colleges, and 1,500 research institutes. We also have the second largest pool of scientists and engineers in the world. And every year we have something like 2.5 million graduates who come out, and which include a number of engineers and about 1.5 lakh IT professionals. So this actually forms the largest pool of the HR group is, is something that we can capitalize on. So this low-cost workforce and high-level science has to be meshed together, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of mentoring and grooming to pull this talent off. And our leaders will then have to give them good remuneration as well as challenging work environment for them to participate and work in our projects. I may also add that for the growing aerospace sector, the IF is also a repository of quality HR pool which needs to be tapped. We have a majority of our retired air crew, test air crew, and maintenance crew. So many of them may be sitting here. They could be employed in the private sector as well because their experience would actually be invaluable. The operational orientation of such professionals along with their exposure to technology development in the industries will be helping in bridging this gap between the IF's requirement and that of the private sector. We've already started positioning project management team, and I will even go to the extent of saying that for any major project, we must have a group of the users working alongside at the factory level itself and to be able to move the project at the same time. I also wish to highlight six major challenges which our aerospace industry perhaps would have to address as it looks into the future. First, of course, is the R&D part, the research and development. And these are absolutely vital for building up our indigenous production base. And just to give you an example today, when we look at the IF's budget to the HAL in the 11th plan, it was something like 56,000 odd crores, and the output itself was close to 57,000 crores uh, in the 11th plan. But when you look at the R&D part of that uh, uh, expenditure there was just about 7% from HL. What I would suggest that that may have to perhaps go up from 12 to up to 12 to 15% if we have to come out uh, and produce something worthwhile. So the R&D part has to be set aside and then only we should be able to progress on these projects. The capital side of course is that all these projects are very capital in intensive. And I think we need to have a long-term commitment because of this capital-intensive nature of our projects. And, and I would suggest that only those who wish to work on the long haul with us before the profits start to come in will actually are the ones who are going to survive. So my advice to the industry as well as to the SMEs is that there is a need to avoid that risk aversion. And if I may also suggest, we all need to start small and then move on to bigger projects. We may even have to start making radio altimeters to start with, moving on to displays, moving on to weather radars, before getting on to major complex systems like structures, controls, and last, of course, is aero engines. The government also has a very major offset management policy, which was introduced in 2005, 2006, and I'm sure everybody here is aware of those. And just to give you an idea that in the last few years, the IF has signed about 14 offset contracts, which is close to about 3.5 billion US dollars. And the effects of these offsets will start to show uh, in the next three to four years. The MRSA itself will attract offset options, something like 20,000 crores. So you can see for yourself the opportunity that the industry is going to get through this offset management policies. In fact, last year itself, in August 2012, uh, uh, this policy has been further expanded to include many other new areas, 
and I'm quite sure you're fam familiar with those, and I do see a fair amount of uh, uh, focus that we're going to have in getting the benefits from this offset policy. Now, while we're talking of military aviation, there is also need to build up our civil aerospace sector as well, because there are a number of complementary technologies which flow from the military side to the civil domain as well. And these applications could be in the navigation side, in air, maritime, terrestrial space domain, communications, entertainment, remote sensing, oceanography, MET, town planning, etc. And I think side by side we need to build up the aerospace sector in the civil side as well. The other issue, of course, is the vendor development. As I mentioned, instead of operating only at the Tier 2, Tier 3, or Tier 4 levels, we have to now start moving up into the Tier 1 level. And that is where the ventures and collaborations have to take place when business models have to be created. And if I'm also mentioned to you that uh, for the last six months or so, for the first time, uh, and that program has been ably supported by the Raksha Mantri himself and Dr. Saraswat, myself, where we pushed the case for the acquisition of the 56 or the replacement of 56 Avro aircraft. And for the first time, the non-PSU uh, parties will be permitted to bid for this project. And I'm happy to tell you that by the end of this month, the RFP actually is going to be released for this particular project. We're also happy to state that many of our big players are joining hands with our indigenous partners and setting up business houses in India. We have Sikorsky, Lockheed Martin working in Hyderabad, we also have news of Daso and Reliance, which is following suit very shortly. We also have uh, the other news about the favorable policies of, of the IPR, the intellectual property and the technology transfer policies, which are now being relaxed to meet our requirements. The other issues as the aerospace industry grows, we need to strengthen our SEMILAC and our certification agencies to cope up with the requirements of the future. And I think of some favorable government policies in terms of financing as well would be uh, the order of the day because these certainly need to be strengthened if we have to meet the challenges of the, of the next 20 to 30 years. I also believe that we should be able to open up some of our labs and testing facilities to the private industries because actually speaking, these are all national assets. So in conclusion, I would reiterate that the IF will fully support any effort towards developing our indigenous aerospace production base in our industry. That is our commitment, and we stand by that commitment. At the same time, I must mention that we cannot compromise on our capability building efforts as it can have serious ramifications. Although we have seen some delays in some of our indigenous projects, I can assure you that we need to look ahead and we need to continue persisting with these projects. I think the time has come for all of our stakeholders to get on board to work together and evolve a joint strategy for future implementation. So I once again thank the organizers of the seminar for their involvement and efforts, and I'm confident that the deliberations will throw up some many new ideas and different perspectives in some of the focus areas that we've talked about. The IF is certainly going through a defining phase in its history, and I invite you to be a valued partners in this endeavor. Thank you, and Jai Hind. Okay.